Thanks, Jonathan, for that introduction. But um, also thank you to MRA, Stephanie, Cody, and the whole team. Um, I have over 100 slides. So we're gonna try to do this very quickly. That's not actually a joke. That's how much progress we've made. And I'm still, um, you know, had to skip over a bunch of things. So let's see if we can get through this pretty quickly. And um, if there's time for questions, we can do it, you know, here during the session or when we do the panel afterwards. Okay, I'm just waiting for that second monitor to come on, but maybe it won't. All right, so we're gonna start with a poll, and if you have your um, phone with you, this QR code will take you to um, this website. Hopefully you don't have to register, hopefully it just goes straight to it. You might just have to enter your name, but it's anonymous. So we'll start here with this poll, I'll give you guys a minute to take the picture. And hopefully everybody has Wi-Fi access and they're doing okay with getting it or cell service here. Okay, let's start with this poll here. Um, you know, after we get to read it. <laughs> Tell me what is the most concerning part of a melanoma diagnosis? Is it uh, physical changes or maybe some disability from the surgery to remove it? Is it the fear of a recurrence or having another melanoma after you have this first one treated? the possibility that this diagnosis may actually decrease your life expectancy? Uh, are you concerned about the treatments, the medicines that we use, or maybe passing this risk on to other family members, maybe children? Or, you know, maybe you're not that concerned because melanoma, of course, is on the skin, and you know that we've made a lot of progress in the last 20 years. So let's give it maybe 10 more seconds, or, or not. <laughs> So it sounds like, yeah, I mean, everybody's afraid really of this survival issue. And I think recurrence goes with that, right? I mean, I, I hear from patients a lot that when they think the melanoma is in their rear view, having that melanoma come back is really troubling because that could mean then a decreased overall survival. So that gets into our adjuvant therapy space. All right, so he, here are my disclosures. Um, really relevant for this talk is everything, because we're really talking about all the progress we've made, which includes research and so forth. I think I might have clicked too far, sorry. Can we go back one? Yeah, thanks. So, so this is all we've had, you know, for the 20 years um, between 1970 and 1990, um, or you could call that 30 years if you wanted, but all we had really was decarbazine, which was approved on the basis of no randomized trials, just, you know, the FDA felt like there was some anecdotal evidence of efficacy there. So decarbazine chemotherapy was approved, adjuvant interferon alpha in the 90s, and then it was a nice decade because a few years later they had metastatic therapy with high-dose interleukin-2. But we've made a lot of progress since then. You know, prior to, um, prior to uh, 2011, when ipilimumab and what we consider our modern era was approved, survival did segregate by stage. It still does. So earlier stage melanomas certainly have a higher survival than lower stage. But we had this, you know, low survival rate for stage four where it would just be maybe a year or less of survival. And that's really no longer the case. The way we think of metastatic melanoma, you can have five-year survival rates that exceed more than half the population. So we think we've really changed this in just the last 10 to 15 years. So let me show you here. This is what we think of when we as providers talk about progress. We think about new drugs. And in fact, as you heard from Stephanie, there were two more drug approvals this last year. We actually have 33 drugs listed on the NIH website as approved for melanoma. Um, we have new settings where we're using these drugs. So now we're using approved drugs in the adjuvant setting and bringing them into the preoperative or neoadjuvant setting. When we talk about metastatic disease, we talk about treatments in the front line the second line. We have options now for brain metastasis, central nervous system disease, and these rare melanoma subtypes. But we also think about managing your toxicity and side effects. And what's happened really in the last decade and a half is better understanding of the side effects from therapies as recent as TIL and as old as ipilimumab. So you'll see many institutions creating these toxicity teams just to address those side, 
effects. And of course, we are looking for improved efficacy. We want better response rates and longer durability of that response that hopefully translates into survival. But I wonder, these may not fully align with what patients and caregivers and advocacy think of as um, progress. There may be different things like treatment-free periods or oral drugs versus IV drugs. So you see, we still have to kind of align what it means to make progress in both of these spheres. These are all the drugs listed um, on the, the NCI website, and it's pretty impressive when you take a look at this. Now, yes, some of these are kind of outdated, you know, high dose IL-2, um, IL-2's on there twice, interferon's on there in a couple different ways, but nevertheless, it's pretty impressive that these are the drugs we have now. So let's take a Another poll question, one more time, if you have that, um, that poll pulled up, it should probably advance to the second question, but if not, here's the QR code one more time. And we're going to talk about what progress means to patients, caregivers, advocacy. And here I want you to just rank the choices. If we could actually go back, sorry. Yeah. So what does melanoma progress look like to you? Would it be decreasing the rates of recurrence? So once you have your melanoma treated, um, treatments to basically decrease uh, the rate at which it comes back, improving maybe cosmetic outcomes, because certainly some of our melanomas uh, occur on very sensitive areas, the head and neck, the face, other places. Is it curing metastatic disease? What is progress? You know, is that the number one progress that we need to cure metastatic disease, or do we need to get in front of early disease better? Is it decreasing the incidence of developing brain metastasis? We know that that's a, a serious location where melanoma can go, so would we like to maybe make improvements there? Should we be addressing the side effects better, or should we be talking about uh, treatment-free periods? And of course, this is not a comprehensive list. You know, financial toxicity is certainly a place where we need to make progress. Um, let's go ahead and advance, yeah. Okay, so curing seems like it's really top for a lot of people. Sorry, there's something in my contact here. And then decreasing the rates of recurrence next. Certainly long periods being treatment free. It sounds like it's really important to patients to be able to take breaks off of therapy and not necessarily be on it um, in the long term. And then of course, decreasing the rates of brain metastasis, lowering the rates of side effects and cosmesis is there, but maybe not the top uh, progress for you guys. Okay, great. So let's talk about where we are today and then we'll go into where we are tomorrow. I've got 30 minutes to get through what feels like 90 more slides. And just to ground you for today, I'm gonna to show you a lot of what we call Kaplan-Meier survival curves. And so when you look at these, really just at a high level, what I want you to take away is do the curves look like they have separate, they're separating, they have differences between the two treatments, or do they look like they're pretty much on top of each other, there's no difference between treatments, or, in some cases, do they look like they actually cross? So you see here the red curve actually crosses over the black curve and ends up lower. And that's just at a high level what you want to take away. Are they separate? Do they, does, it, does it appear that the treatments have some difference? Are they the same, or do they cross? Okay, so now moving on. Let's talk about um, what is our evidence for for randomized trial data in, let's say, the neoadjuvant adjuvant setting. So we have some evidence now in a randomized phase two study of neoadjuvant adjuvant immunotherapy, and we have a host of data in the adjuvant setting for all these different stages of melanoma. So let's start first quickly with the, the preoperative, or what we call the neoadjuvant setting. So in this space, the International Neoadjuvant Melanoma Consortium is a global organization that's really looked at taking pilot studies done at special centers of excellence and pooling them to date together and saying, what do we know? And we know that you can use targeted therapy for patients with BRAF positive disease, and you can use immunotherapy um, for basically positive, BRAF positive and negative disease in a preoperative setting. But just quickly when we look at this, what you see is there might be a higher survival um, sort of expected if you use immunotherapy rather than targeted therapy. So the neoadjuvant space has moved towards this, though there are trials still doing uh, targeted therapy and even some injectable therapy. 
And in SWOG, we ran uh, what was called S1801, a randomized phase two study, where we said if you have operable melanoma in place and it has a positive lymph node or a metastatic site that is considered fully operable, let's randomize those patients to having surgery and then taking the standard of care, which one of the standards of care is one year of adjuvant pembrolizumab, versus doing some of that pembrolizumab preoperatively, then surgery, so take out the tumor still, and then 15 doses after. So both of these study arms received 18 doses of pembrolizumab. The real difference was just how we sequenced it. All of those pembrolizumab doses after surgery, adjuvant, or some of it before and some of it after, neoadjuvant, adjuvant. And what we saw here was the group that took neoadjuvant adjuvant pembrolizumab appeared to have a better what we called event-free survival, which means they had less recurrences, less inability, say, um, to uh, get adjuvant therapy due to toxicity or recurrence of that matter. So the neoadjuvant adjuvant, just by moving a few doses before surgery, looks favorable, but with the caveat that this was a phase two study. So phase two studies are interesting and they often um, test a hypothesis, but they are not necessarily considered confirmatory. And there is another uh, study coming on the horizon, which actually um, I understand might be reading out very soon. It's called the Nadina study. And similar to S1801, it has an adjuvant arm in gold there at the bottom versus a neoadjuvant arm. And you see that green box. Let me see if I can show you with the mouse here. I don't see a mouse, but do you guys see a mouse? No. Okay. You saw, see it now? Okay, there it is. Yeah. So this green box here, maybe I'm not controlling it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, that green... <laughs> That green box is the neoadjuvant arm. So patients are getting two doses of nivolumab and ipilimumab um, preoperatively, and it's a lower dose of ipilimumab than the FDA-approved metastatic dose. They get two doses and then have surgery. And based on what they see at surgery, the adjuvant therapy is chosen. So this study will be um, very interesting to see how does doublet immunotherapy fare compared to single immunotherapy all in the adjuvant setting. So let's talk about post-operative therapy or that adjuvant setting. We've made a lot of progress now. We have therapy now for 2B and 2C melanoma, not for 2A, but that's really because um, the survival of 2A patients, the recurrence of them is so low, it's unclear that we can impact the survival this early uh, if they don't have that many recurrences. So let's look at the 2B, 2C space. A lot of progress in the last couple of years. The keynote 716. In and here you see the blue curve, which is the active therapy pembrolizumab, is, um, seems to separate from the gray curve of observation placebo, if you will. And then Checkmate 76K is the other study in 2B2C. This is nivolumab versus um, placebo. And you can see here as well, the green curve sits on top. So what about 3A? And I put an asterisk because there's some studies that looked at 3A disease, but many of these studies either looked at 3B, 3C and higher or had specific requirements for 3A. So maybe you had to have a millimeter of tumor in that lymph node or you had to have two microscopic lymph nodes involved. That was S1404's criteria. And so these are slightly different criteria than just being 3A. Um, but in 3A, the two studies that we have are Keynote 054, you see on top, and then S1404. And this is just showing you that there, those studies had just small numbers of 3A patients, again, because the criteria to make it in was a little difficult. 3B, 3C patients, so there are three studies that looked at this. Here's Keynote 054, blue is doing better than red here, so pembrolizumab better than placebo. This is S1404, this is pembrolizumab versus ipilimumab or interferon. Furon. So that's, you won't see the curve separate as easily there because it's treatment versus treatment as opposed to treatment versus placebo or treatment versus observation. But you do see the separation in recurrence-free survival, maybe not as much in overall survival, which is on the bottom. 
And then we looked post recurrence too in that study. And then we also have Checkmate 238. And here's the Checkmate 238 data. You see an improvement in that recurrence free survival at the top, maybe not as much in the overall survival. Checkmate 238 is another study of active therapy versus active therapy. Nivolumab versus ipilimumab. So there may be a benefit in RFS, recurrence-free survival, but perhaps not in overall survival. Now stage four, no evidence of disease. Years ago I had a patient say, why do you keep calling me Ned in the chart? And I said, oh yeah, it means no evidence of disease. After that, he said every time he would come, please call me Ned. Please tell me my nickname is Ned. So stage four, no evidence of disease is a unique situation. It means the melanoma has left its local area, let's say the arm or the arm pit if the lymph nodes were involved there and has gone somewhere else. And you can kind of think of it as can the radiation doctors zap that area in one field. So if it's the other side of the body, no. If it's the groin or the lower part of the body, no. And if it's internal, typically no. So that's stage four. But if that melanoma can be removed, let's say it's on the opposite side of the body or a spot in the lung or liver, and it can be removed, you're now considered stage four, no evidence of disease. And we kind of consider maybe that you're in this near, uh, this adjuvant setting again. Can we do something to prevent it from coming back? So some of these trials actually looked at it. Checkmate 238 had stage 4 NED. S1404 did. And then I'll tell you about this cool study called the Immuned study. So Checkmate 234 um, had a small portion of stage 4 M1A, M1B, M1C. That just usually tells us about the anatomic location of that melanoma. And you can see that curve above is just for the stage 4 patients. So taking nivolumab seems to do better than taking ibilimumab, at least in an exploratory fashion, after removal of a metastatic deposit. What about S1404? We had a small portion of those patients also favoring pembrolizumab versus is the ipilimumab or interferon control, and then this Immuned study. So this study looked at nivolumab plus ipilimumab. Basically use stage four as the justification. That's what we would do for a metastatic patient many times. But the, in this case, the melanoma has been removed. And what you see here, they compared the... Um, the nivolumab ipilimumab versus, observa versus observation, and then they had a nivolumab alone arm, again, versus observation. And you can see this blue curve is doing really well here. So this is the nivolumab plus ipilimumab arm. So that might, that's a very intriguing uh, signal to see in the stage four population. But what about nivolumab ipilimumab in the adjuvant setting in general? So for a stage three, um, you know, we talked about 3A has unique criteria for eligibility, but 3B, 3C. So there was a study called Checkmate 915 that looked at nivolumab plus ipilimumab versus nivolumab. Now remember, two, a study that has two active therapy arms, it's always going to be challenging to see a distinct difference between those two arms. And the conclusion of this study is that there is no difference between nivolumab and ipilimumab and nivolumab for all stage 3 and 4 resected melanoma. But that Immuned suggests that if you're a stage four resected, maybe the combination does appear to be better. So Checkmate 915 was a negative study. It's important to talk about progress while also mentioning where we learn and what studies might be negative. And certainly just a brief mention that we also have targeted therapy for BRAF positive patients in the adjuvant setting, and that's the COMBI-AD study. This is adjuvant dibrafenib trametinib that did better than adjuvant placebo. So many of you guys heard since this last meeting last year, there was excitement around the Moderna vaccine trial with in combination with Merck, and that's this Keynote 942 study. So this, these patients um, with stage 3B all the way up to that stage 4 resected to no evidence of disease were randomized to pembrolizumab alone. You see that in the black curve versus pembrolizumab plus a personalized vaccine. So that melanoma that was removed was sent off and was grown to a personal vaccine. So each patient's vaccine was unique to them. And that vaccine was it started administration around six weeks into that study. And so everybody started off getting pembrolizumab, but the red curve of patients started getting their vaccine about six weeks into treatment. And what you see here, it's a phase two study, but you see what appears to be a nice separation from that red and black curve. And then another endpoint that we call distant metastasis-free survival, which is what did this 
decrease the rate of some distant disease. And you see here again a nice trend towards that. And so on the basis of that, many of you are aware that there's a randomized phase three trial happening now to confirm that phase two result. So that's adjuvant and neoadjuvant, so post-operative and pre-operative settings. Let's talk about that metastatic setting. We'll often call this frontline or treatment naive or 1L. Sometimes you'll see it abbreviated. With the caveat that all of this data that I'm going to show you, nearly all of it, essentially assumed that nobody took any of that adjuvant or neoadjuvant therapy. So will this treatment that I'm about to show you work as well if you've done one of those? The answer is we just don't know, and we're gathering some of that just in the real world. So the DreamSeq trial was a trial of, for BRAF-positive patients to ask the question, do we start with the BRAF-targeted therapies first and then switch to immuno once the melanoma progresses, if it does, or do we do the opposite? Do we start with immunotherapy and at progression start to switch to targeted therapy? A highly important question in our field that really needed to be answered. And um, uh, ECOG Akron ran this study under the leadership of Dr. Michael Atkins. And what we found was, first of all, these are response rates here. The important thing to note is that those first arms that you start with, either arm A or arm B, had similar response rates, but by starting with one regimen, you could directly impact the efficacy of the next regimen. So if you look at arm C, um, the targeted therapy still worked after arm A immunotherapy. But if you look at arm D, the immunotherapy didn't seem to be as strongly effective in the second line after targeted therapy. And what does that mean in terms of survival? That means here, this is that, that curve that crosses, is that here the nivolumab, ipilimumab, or immunotherapy first arm seems to have the improvement in two-year overall survival. So at two years, there was a 20% improvement in survival if you started with the immunotherapy. This is now a guiding practice for a lot of oncologists, except for the fact that because the curves cross, and because at first the red curve is doing better than the black curve, there is a feeling that there will be a portion of patients for whom targeted therapy is beneficial to start with. And so now we have to figure out who are those patients. Are there markers for them? Is it the amount of cancer or melanoma that they have? Is it specific anatomic? sites. And so that was this issue here, the early events on the IO first arm. We abbreviate immunotherapy as IO often, immuno-oncology, and TT to mean targeted therapy. So that what you see here is these patients, unfortunately, when they started off um, on the black curve first, they did not do as great uh, at the beginning as the targeted therapy group. Again, we have to figure out what is the what do those patients look like? It's going to make up the minority of these patients with the BRAF mutation, but we need to figure out who they are. So what about another option of immunotherapy in the front line? So that is the Relativity 047 study and the new combination of nivolumab plus relatlimab. In the front line, untreated metastatic melanoma setting, meaning no adjuvant therapy, these patients were randomized to nivolumab or a combination of nivolumab relatlimab. And you see in that light blue line that they're doing better by what we call progression-free survival. So the time it takes that metastatic melanoma to actually progress. And just to give you the background on that earlier combination of olimab, ipilimumab, this is the Checkmate 067 study. These patients were randomized to combination immunotherapy or single agent nivolumab or single agent ipi. And what you see is these are the response rates in the long term. Let me show you this curve maybe. So this is the combination we have the longest survival with at seven and a half years. And you see that top a curve that's sitting on top is the combination nivolumab ipilimumab arm. So this is metastatic disease. This is what we would you know, colloquially call stage four disease. And you see that that median survival, look how far this goes out, seven and a half years. At 60 months, which is across the bottom here, there we go, thanks. <laughs> 60 months across the bottom, you see more than half of patients are uh, alive. That's in stark contrast to that curve that, that went up to 2011, where very few patients were making it past the one year mark. Here, more than half of patients are making it um, you know, five years, so very exciting. So I guess this brings up the question, which immunotherapy combination is better? Is it nevo-ipi or nivolumab-relatlimab, nevo-rela? 
We don't know. I mean, that's the facts. We don't know. But I do uh, encourage you to watch this space for maybe some trials where we might do something like this, where we would take a treatment-naive or metastatic, a treatment-naive metastatic melanoma patient and randomize them to nevo ipi or nevo rela. But of course, all the things I said, what if they had neoadjuvant therapy? What if they had adjuvant therapy? We might have to stratify for those factors. Okay, there's another approval in this frontline setting that maybe people are aware of, but you will not see a lot of oncologists using, and it's triple therapy for patients with the BRAF mutation. FDA approved BRAF plus MEC plus PD-1. And here's the data on that. It's from the Inspire 150 trial. It was Vemurafenib, Cobimetinib, and a pdl one inhibitor called atezolizumab. And what you see here is that red curve seems to outperform the blue curve in terms of progression-free survival. It's 15 months versus 10 months. That was statistically significant. This is overall survival here. You see the subtle crossing that happens. So that's interesting, right? Again, that might mean there there's a portion of patients um, for whom the atezolizumab is not working quickly enough. It might mean there's some imbalance in the study design. But let me show you, there were two other triple studies, one called the COMBI and one called Keynote 022, and they were negative studies. So COMBI was very similar, spartalizumab plus a BRAF-MEC inhibitor versus placebo BRAF-MEC. And again, 16 months versus 12 months, but here this did not meet statistical significance. A one-sided p-value statistically has to be doubled to tell you the statistical two-sided significance. So it turns out to be zero. 0.084, and we like 0 0.05, 0 0.05 as significance in most of our studies. So this ended up being not significant, but you see those numbers are very similar to that Inspire 150. And then look at this Keynote 022 Pembrolizumab, Dibrafenib, Trametinib versus Dibrafenib, Trametinib. Again, you see these curves separate. But statistically, they're not that uh, different. Now, the caveat with Keynote 022 is because of prior experience, there was some feeling that they could read this out early. And the mistake that was made by you know, the, the, the investigators in the study, it's a good lesson learned, is they looked too soon. They looked at nine months. So nine months is right about here. So with a median follow-up of nine months, this difference between these two curves is not statistically different. And they used all of their statistical, what we call alpha. So they used all of their ability to look at this at that nine months. But then when they went back, this is exploratory only, they had no alpha left to do this. At longer follow-up, look what happens. You can see there's a real difference in these two curves, both in progression-free and overall survival but it's insignificant once you've used all your statistical alpha. So that's a lesson learned, maybe not to get too excited and look too soon at these randomized trials. But again, if you look at the median um, months, it's 16.9 and 10.7. All of these triplet trials have a very similar progression-free survival between 15, 16 months, but an unclear benefit when it comes to overall survival. Are you living longer taking triple therapy? And the thing that I didn't show you is there is added toxicity. When you overlap PD-1 or PDL one with BRAF max, you get a ton of derm toxicities, potential for colitis, potential for um, worsening liver enzymes. And so that toxicity really set it over the edge. And if you're not going to live any longer, if you can just sequence these therapies and live um, just as long, it's unclear if this triplet is really worth it. So that's really why you don't see a lot of uh, US oncologists giving this, or globally for that matter. Also, these trials were slightly different um, in, in some of their features. But now there is there are still triplet trials ongoing. So there's something called the Starboard trial, which takes frontline, so treatment-naive metastatic melanoma patients, um, and it randomizes them to oncorafenib, binimetin, Pembrolizumab. Two of those other studies used dibrafenib trametinib and one used vemurafenib cobi. So here's a triplet with the third generation on carafenib benimetinib randomizing to pembrolizumab alone. And you might say, why would I want to be a patient randomized to pembrolizumab alone? It's because you would still have access to on carafenib benimetinib if the melanoma is not cured with that frontline pembrolizumab. You would still have access to combination. And Based on what we saw in DreamSeq, the response rate to combination targeted therapy is still really good after being exposed to immunotherapy first. And you won't have all that toxicity of triple. So there may be some benefit of being in this trial and getting randomized to single arm because it can be very effective and certainly can have the same survival with less toxicity. 
There's also a brain METS trial using triplet. So this is one we're running in SWOG, and it's triplet therapy for symptomatic brain metastasis in patients who have not been previously treated. So if you have not been previously treated for metastatic disease, and one of the places you developed your metastasis is in the brain, and you have symptoms, which we're now defining a little more carefully, this is a study that randomizes BRAF positive patients to that triple of Onkraf, Nibinimetinib, plus Nivol, or to ipilimumab and nivolumab. We know these regimens have efficacy in the brain. And this, by the way, this study is almost closed, so maybe this is a small pitch. There's only a few slots left in this study, about five slots left, and then we might start to hear uh, something soon in the next year. Secombit is another really exciting study, sequential combination immunotherapy and targeted therapy. So this is asking the question, why does the BRAF patient have to choose one or the other? Why do they have to only get BRAF MEK first or immunotherapy first and then wait till cancer progresses to get the other? Is there not a way to get both? In kidney cancer, we often combine these things. And so this study basically took the sequential arms of similar to DreamSeq and added a sandwich arm where you get BRAF MEK inhibitor for eight weeks, then switch to immuno, and then more BRAF MEK um, if the melanoma progresses. So that sandwich arm is the really interesting one. That's arm C here. It's in red. And you can see in overall survival, it starts out doing quite well. And then, you know, we're not sure. It's pretty much in striking distance with the immunotherapy first arm. But what's really interesting is, should we do DreamSeq or should we do Secombit? Should we do immunotherapy and switch to targeted therapy at progression, or should we sandwich? And really, there is a study that is looking at this called the EORTC EBIN study, where they're doing a DreamSeq-like arm and then powering it to compare to that sandwich arm. And it's a slightly different sandwich regimen, and it's a slightly different duration. And this one is powered to compare these arms where the previous Secombit was not powered all the way. What if your comparator was single agent? Um, and so immunocobivem was a trial that was done mostly in Germany where they looked at this. Interestingly, maybe I'll just jump to the conclusion here. Another study where you see things kind of um, cr crossing over here. So initially, um, you're having very good progression-free survival, but no benefit in overall survival. And you, everybody starts out getting vemurafenib. The group that switches to it, uh, immunotherapy actually loses that that tumor control fairly rapidly, but then ends up on top in terms of overall survival. So interesting signals here that we're gonna spend, I think, the next few years really teasing apart what this means. And then there's a study called the Cowboy Study that is not based out of Texas, believe it or not, but it's vemurafenib, cobimetinib, a short run-in of six weeks, and then uh, moving that on to uh, immunotherapy versus the traditional immunotherapy. So this study is ongoing. What do we do after the front line? What's in the second line? And I'm gonna race through this because I just hit the halfway point and I have a whole bunch of till slides at the end because I figured you guys have a ton of till questions. <laughs> so, okay, 16, 16, we looked at this study. This study was done to say after you take PD-1 in the frontline metastatic setting, what works next? Is it just ipilimumab or do we keep the PD-1 going and add ipilimumab? So ipilimumab alone or combination. Here you see basically the combination seems to be doing better than ipi alone. There was also a study called LEAP004 after PD-1 progression, and this added um, lenvatinib, which is a type of VEGF and multi-kinase inhibitor, to the pembrolizumab. Had a really impressive what we call waterfall plot here. Um, and so in the second line, this is NCCN compendium listed as a potential option with some caveats of toxicity, but a nice response rate um, and a, a reasonable survival benefit. This, this combination was looked at in the frontline setting and did not seem to do better than, say, pembrolizumab alone. So I showed you starboard. There's also port side, which is a very similar design, except it's for patients who received PD-1 first. So if you took PD-1 in your frontline metastatic setting and your melanoma progresses and you have a BRAF mutation, you can get triple versus double. That's different than all those other triple trials that were mostly in the frontline setting. Okay. Now I think we're on to till, which is the next, uh, the next and last polling question here. So I redid these slides in the last 72 hours in light of till approval because I figured it was important to go over it. Let's talk about it. Let's see what questions you have. Um, it's the start of what we hope is a big tidal wave coming. So let's talk about till and go over these poll questions. Um, one back, please, please, please. 
So it's really asking the question, what excites you about TIL therapy? Are you excited about how new it is? It's the newest drug, you want it, you're an iPhone, you know, 100 kind of person, you want the newest model of whatever. Um, do you like that it's a finite treatment period? And maybe you did or didn't know that, but TIL is essentially, you know, one-time kind of treatment. It's a long course, several weeks, but once you do it, you're done. Do you like, are you excited about the response rate that we're seeing in TIL or the duration of response or maybe future trials? So using maybe the engineered TIL, armored TIL, these are clinical trials, not approved yet. Or are you more excited, scared than excited because there's surgery involved with TIL? There's also chemotherapy that we often don't talk about anymore. And then really maybe the unknown long-term side effects. Or is this a space where you just really don't know anything about TIL and so you, you need to learn? So let me let you guys answer for a few seconds and let's see what excites you guys. Okay, I'll click it. Or you just click it? Responses? Yeah. Okay. Oh, good. So we have a knowledge gap here. We need we need to inform some people about what TIL is, and then other people are excited about the response rate. Yeah. Great. 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 Nobody wants to do future TIL trials. We have a lot of them coming. <laughs> All right, so TIL started way back with this gentleman, Steve Rosenberg, when he used something called lymphokine-activated killer cells in the 1970s and started expanding them for melanoma patients and gave them to the first melanoma patient. You see this report from 1985 in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, it wasn't a randomized trial. You couldn't find that many patients to do it, so it was called a special report back then. But you could see that giving these lacquer lymphokine-activated killer cells plus interleukin-2 could engender some response. And so fast forward, you know, nearly 40 years, uh, actually more than 40 years, right? Almost 40 years, 1985 to 2014. Um, here we are with Lifey Lucell which is the drug that just got approved on Friday. And the process for Lifelucel is for metastatic melanoma patients that have received prior treatment. So they've either received a PD-1 inhibitor or BRAF MEK inhibitor if they are BRAF positive. So you have to be screened. There are some still requirements for this treatment that have to be met. Even though it's not a clinical trial, you need to pass some criteria, um, almost similar to receiving, you know, say a MEK inhibitor or immunotherapy for melanoma. It's not necessarily for everybody. And then you have to have a tumor that can be removed. So tumor infiltrating lymphocytes is what we call this treatment. And lymphocytes are just T cells, right? But as I have told patients for now 16 years, we can't call it TITS therapy because that would probably be fairly offensive to some people. But it's tumor infiltrating T cells. That's what it is. It's TITS. Um, so these tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, they are inside a tumor. So you actually have to take a tumor out. We can't get this, this type of therapy directly from the blood. And it's unclear if we can do it from biopsies. At least this approval right now requires um, surgery. So you have to be fit enough to undergo surgery, right? That's general anesthesia and all the cardiac risks of surgery. So you undergo surgery, and then you undergo what's called non-myeloablative lymphodepletion. So it's about a week of chemotherapy that you get in the hospital. Yeah, a lot of people's hair does fall out, but it's transient, it does come back. Yes, there's some nausea, vomiting, and maybe some diarrhea, there's some fluid overload. That chemotherapy is useless against the melanoma. So it really can't kill the melanoma, it's actually quieting down your immune system. So we are about to give you all these tits, if you will, these till, and they need a place to go. So the, that chemotherapy is really focused on making space in the bone marrow and the body and the circulation for those and eliminating the competition. If you have too many other flowers in the garden, that one bloom that you want will not populate as easily. So we're removing those with that non-myeloablative chemotherapy. And then you get your till. About three, four weeks after you had your surgery, ideally, you get a um, fresh batch of your T cells. And these were your T cells that were inside your melanoma tumor, expanded in a lab, and so they are yours, 
So they're autologous, you won't reject them. They're specific for the melanoma, so they don't really have another purpose. They can't, um, they can't protect you against the flu or COVID or shingles or anything like that. They're really just for your melanoma, as long as your melanoma hasn't mutated in those few weeks away from it. And then we give you interleukin-2, which is essentially a type of fertilizer or miracle grow, if you will, to keep those T cells going. As soon as we infuse these T cells, some of them are gonna die off, and so we have to keep them going with interleukin-2, and then there's a recovery period while your blood counts recover because of that chemotherapy, and you might be in the hospital two to three weeks. It all depends on how robust your bone marrow is, how long it takes the, the blood counts and things to recover. And so early on, life e loose cell had this type of response. This is what we call a waterfall plot. Everything that's downward deflecting means the tumors were decreasing to some degree, and so it looked like 81% of these early, you know, these patients in this early study were having some reduction in their tumor burden. This was longer term data that was eventually reviewed in 2021 and published in 2022. And you see with even more patients that seems to maintain that this is beneficial for the majority in decreasing the tumor burden. Now the, this company of course went to the FDA in 2021 and the FDA came back and said, we need some more information. We need to know how potent these T cells are before you put them in the humans. So were there, they, they asked them for things called a potency assay. And that's what delayed this approval was getting some of that additional work done. Meanwhile, we knew clinically in patients for all these years that it was effective. And how, how well does it work? How long does it work? These are patients in a slightly different cohort that were responders. And this shows you kind of how long, and you can see here, this is months from treatment. So this data cuts off at about two and a half years, but you can see in many of these patients, it can be quite durable. But I implore you to look at data very carefully when you look at response. Rate. If you're going to have to have a surgery and then, of course, be in the hospital for two and three weeks, you want to make sure it translates into real benefit, right? So looking at things like how many patients are alive at one year, two years, et cetera, is important. This is the updated co uh, duration of response here with those additional patients. So then after 2021, we heard this finally had a FDA date in November, and we were all very excited last summer, thinking, well, this will be here by the end of the year. And then we saw this news release in September that said, no, 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 the FDA has a backlog of reviews, and this actually won't get reviewed until February. But as you all know, on Friday, the FDA did approve yet another first-in-class therapy in the space of melanoma. So ipilimumab checkpoint inhibitor occurs first, um, first uh, in class, and then nivolumab ipilimumab first in class, and then we had the bispecific molecule to Bentifus first in class, and so melanoma continues to just break the ceiling, and this is literally in less than 15 years uh, of clinical trials. So what does the future hold for TIL? Let me see if I can take you through this in two minutes that are left. I think we're going to be doing a lot of things with TIL. We're going to add checkpoint inhibitor to it right now patients who take BRAF and MEK uh, inhibitors are often able to continue that up until their TIL therapy and maybe even with the TIL. We're going to potentially move it earlier in the line because um, what you might hear from some of our panelists here is that this TIL therapy was approved after you've already received treatment, but would it work even better if we moved it sooner? We can engineer these TIL, we can make, we can give you precision TIL, we can do things even better. So TIL plus pembrolizumab is another study that's coming. It's life -e loose cell plus pembrolizumab, a study called TILVANCE. And this study, this slide might be a little bit busy, but it's that same process. It's screening, it's surgery, it's you take some pembrolizumab while your TIL are growing, then the non-myeloablative chemotherapy, then the infusion, some IL-2, then more pembrolizumab. And this is some early evidence in a prior study prior to this, um, this randomized TILVANCE that I'll show you that it did look like it was working in melanoma. Oh, sorry, I went too fast on that. But this is some of the melanoma cohorts here. You see it on the far left melanoma, and this is TIL in combination with pembrolizumab. Every single one of these patients had some decrease in their tumor burden. You could ar make the argument, well, that was pembrolizumab doing the work. We don't know, right? But it certainly is favorable that all these patients had a good response. So this confirmatory trial, TILVANCE, is happening now, where patients would get randomized to either pembrolizumab or pembrolizumab plus TIL. And if you take pembrolizumab and it's somehow your melanoma is not well controlled, you can cross over and get your TIL down the road. So both arms will have access to TIL. 
This is the crossover for the pembrolizumab arm. There's also ways to engineer TIL to put genes in there to make it work better, to put genes in there so that you do, the T cells don't get turned off as easily. So that's considered engineered TIL, and there's modifications we can me, uh, make using viral vectors to, to work on those genes. We can also do something called precision TIL. So we take out your melanoma, but then we sequence it, and we look at the top candidates um, that are hits for that, that uh, melanoma tumor, and and then we only expand the T cells that recognize those hits. And so that's considered precision till, and there's a couple of studies, Chiron and Thetis, um, gods of what, water and sun maybe. Uh, these are ongoing mostly overseas. And then there's some cool stuff that can be done with microfluidics and getting T cells just from your bloodstream. So TIL therapy is tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, but you can also, you have a, millions of T cells circulating in your bloodstream right now, and some of them recognize cancer. That If you have cancer or a future cancer, if it develops, and you can actually use microfluidics to identify these T cells. If you take blood and you separate out the white cells and you picture the as being on a chip. These T cells can then each land on a specific well of a chip, and it starts to form this skyscraper-like phenomenon. So you've got T cells recognizing this, that, and the other, and then you can start to sort them. So you can sort them using these, so let's say these are the candidate T cell receptors that you want. You put this chip in there, you start um, putting the sort of Velcro in those wells, and then what you actually, it's so hard to see here, these are you know micro channels, but then you actually can start to accumulate the cells that you need in the chambers that have the um, the the T cell the the anti-sense of the T cell signal or the anti-sequence of the T cell receptor that you want. And then you grow just those T cells. And so that's considered you know, nanoparticle technology, another way to grow your T cells. It's kind of a beautiful technology that's being developed through a, some companies right now. One of the trials using this is called the ACT engine. So they actually take T cells against a very specific protein that melanoma tends to overproduce called PRAME, and they put it through that microfluidics, they get your T cells against PRAME, and then they can give it back to you. I forgot I had rare melanoma and brain mets in here too. But maybe in the interest of time, I'll let our panelists actually talk about these. Rare melanoma, there's lifey loose cell, there's TIL for mucosal. And we saw a 50% response rate in these 12 patients that received um, mucosal melanoma patients that received TIL. We've got tibentifusp for uveal melanoma, and this drug was FDA approved now two years ago. We heard some updated three-year overall survival. You see that that red curve is still um, doing better than, say, the investigator's choice curve, which was mostly pembrolizumab. We have this drug called Hepzado, or percutaneous hepatic perfusion in uveal melanoma. This was FDA approved last year, so since last year's um, MRI patient forum. And then some exciting trials coming in uveal melanoma melanoma, Jerova, Sertib, Crizotinib, looks like it works quite nicely. This is very reminiscent of our BRAF MEK inhibitor curves that we used to see in skin melanoma. And does it work across HLA status? The short answer is yes, it does. What about central nervous system disease? What about brain metastasis? So Secombit, that sequencing study of BRAF MEK, the sandwich arm did something really cool this last year, showed us brain metastasis-free survival. And you see that red arm? Remember I was sort of hesitating about how does it do in overall survival, but look at brain metastasis free, starting with BRAF mech and then switching after a fixed period and then picking back up BRAF mech at progression. You're actually decreasing the development of brain mets compared to starting um, with immunotherapy first. So very interesting. It's not powered for this, it's just exploratory. But let's say brain metastasis does develop. The sequencing arm also, again, here seems to be doing quite well. Again, very small numbers here, but it's an interesting signal. And then um, some really powerful work that came out of MD Anderson this last year in the space of leptomeningeal disease. So if the melanoma makes it into the spinal fluid or the meninges that line the brain, we call that leptomeningeal disease, it's a terribly difficult place to treat because that's essentially moving fluid so that the melanoma is not staying still. And um, giving intrathecal or uh, nivolumab directly into the spinal fluid in combination with traditional intravenous nivolumab, just some beautiful work from my colleague and partner at MD Anderson, Dr. Uh, Isabella Glitza, who showed that she can actually improve the historical survival of these patients. You can see by doing this treatment in the spinal fluid and in the vein, we're taking a very difficult um, place to treat melanoma and improving, give, you know, half of these patients are living beyond seven and a half months, which is really an incredible feat here.
I highlighted it down here for you. All right, so this uh, is a patient forum. These are some of my patients with their permission have allowed me to share. These are patients, uh, you know, that have had all of this, brain mets, mucosal melanoma, uveal melanoma. We're trying to make progress in all of these areas. And I thank you guys for attending online, for coming here in person. Uh, let me switch it up here and get to the panelists so we can also hear from them and then get some questions here. All right? Thanks, everybody. Thank you.